When it comes to traversing the country, train travel is not very high on Americans' list. In fact, the United States ranks below many industrialized nations when it comes to ridership on its passenger rail. Perhaps this is because many of these countries also spend a lot more on rail infrastructure than the U.S., with China spending the most out of any country. But investment in U.S. rail is picking up. Rail car manufacturing revenue in the U.S., including for freight trains, is expected to reach $2.9 billion by 2028. Meanwhile, investment in passenger rolling stock, which includes high-speed rail, light rail, metro, passenger coaches, and locomotives, is expected to increase at a rate of 4.7% per year between 2021 and 2026 across North America. A big boost to the rail industry comes from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was passed in 2021 and designates $66 billion to improve the nation's rail system. This law makes us the most significant investment in roads and bridges in the past 70 years. It makes the most significant investment in passenger rail in the past 50 years and in public transit ever. A large chunk of this money will go to Amtrak, the federally owned U.S. passenger train operator, which will use the money for new trains and improvement projects. About $36 billion will go towards inner-city passenger rail service, run by individual states in partnership with the federal government. About $5 billion will cover rail improvements, and $3 billion will be used to eliminate railroad crossings. Private companies like Brightline are also hoping to get a piece of the pie. The company has already built out its passenger rail service in Florida, and its sister company, Brightline West, is working on a high-speed passenger rail line between Las Vegas and Southern California. For this project, Brightline West is requesting $3.75 billion in federal funding from the infrastructure bill. We are seeing today the demand picking up as the funds basically reach the agencies after the uh, allocation process. And so we're seeing a market that's going to grow close to 20% per year in the coming five years. To take advantage of this federal money, manufacturers must abide by laws, which require the federal government to prefer U.S.-made products in its purchases. The first of such laws was passed in 1933, but over the years, requirements have gotten more stringent. As a result, many of the world's largest passenger train manufacturers are investing in their U.S. operations. For example, since opening its U.S. headquarters in Massachusetts in 2015, Beijing-based CRRC has invested $135 million in two U.S. manufacturing facilities. Meanwhile, Japan-based Hitachi is building a $70 million rail manufacturing plant in Maryland. Well, I think passenger rail in the United States has been a little bit slow in years past because of funding. And if you look at the federal funding that other nations get, it's tremendous. Federal funding is what the one piece that we need. And now that we have it, I think you're going to see a tremendous amount of growth in the industry. But whether these large investments will be enough to convince Americans to embrace train travel is still to be seen. CNBC visited two of the biggest passenger rail car manufacturers operating in the country, Siemens and Alstom, to see how they're ramping up passenger train production and to learn what they see as the future of passenger rail in the U.S. We're here at Siemens Mobility Facility in Sacramento, California, where there are 2,500 employees. This facility is a fully vertical facility. So we start with literally sheet metal and pieces of metal, and we build the car shells. After the car shells are built, we also build the bogies, that are the trucks that the vehicles run on. Then we start the assembly process, and the assembly process is, is putting everything that's needed in a, in a rail car, whether that's seats, sidewall liners, air conditioners, galleys, and all the amenities that go into rail cars. Headquartered in Munich, Germany, Siemens is a multinational conglomerate with business segments including digital industries, smart infrastructure, medical devices, and mobility. In its latest full-year financial report, the company reported revenue of $79 billion. Siemens Mobility makes metro cars, street cars, light rail vehicles, passenger coaches, and locomotives and has been manufacturing in the United States since 1984. Siemens has eight rail manufacturing facilities across the country and is building a ninth in North Carolina. Its 64-acre, 710,000 square foot Sacramento facility serves as its North American train manufacturing headquarters and has been used to make more than 3,000 locomotives, passenger coaches, and light rail vehicles. The facility has the capacity to build around 250 vehicles per year. 
Customers can either buy complete train sets, made up of powered locomotives and passenger coaches, or purchase each type of vehicle separately. About a third of our business here is in light rail vehicles, and the other two thirds are a combination of locomotives and passenger cars. Siemens light rail vehicle customers include transit agencies in San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, and San Diego, among others. Siemens says it makes two thirds of the nation's light rail cars. But Siemens Mobility's largest U.S. customer is Amtrak. In the summer of 2021, Siemens scored a contract worth over $3.4 billion to manufacture and maintain 83 train sets to replace Amtrak's aging fleet across the Northeast Corridor and across various state-supported routes, including in Oregon and Vermont. Siemens says it's completed the design phase for the project and that the first vehicle is in production, with delivery starting in 2024 and finishing by 2030. Private rail operator Brightline also tapped Siemens to design and manufacture locomotive and passenger cars for its rail service in Florida. Brightline has completed phase two of its project connecting Miami to Orlando, and eventually plans to expand service to Tampa. Siemens has delivered a total of 10 train sets for the company and is working on 20 more coaches for Brightline. Part of the design that we did with, with Brightline was bright interiors, big large windows to enable that, a comfortable ride and running at speeds of up to 125 miles per hour. Siemens is also building 32 train sets for Canadian passenger railroad operator Via Rail under a $989 million contract. So far, the company has delivered five of those train sets. To keep up with demand and Buy America provisions, Siemens is building a new $220 million manufacturing plant that will sit on 200 acres in Lexington, North Carolina. The new plant is expected to be completed in 2024 and will initially be able to manufacture about 12 vehicles per month. Siemens is not receiving any money directly from the Biden infrastructure bill, but I can tell you that it's fantastic for the rail industry. It's $66 billion going into our specific customers, and so we expect that to feed its way down to us, and that's part of the reason that we're opening the facility is the investment in the country. The trains that you see behind me here are 100% by America, so we basically source from suppliers on the North American continent. With the supplies being sourced locally, it makes it easier for the customers as well to maintain them. Aside from train manufacturing, Siemens also specializes in rail signaling, communication-based train control, and refurbishing old train cars. Over 2,600 miles away on the other side of the country sits Alstom's train manufacturing facility in Hornell, New York. So this site comprises four different buildings, four different campuses, if you will, and it's about 885,000 square feet under roof of manufacturing in those different buildings. And today we have just about 800 people working here. Like Siemens, Alstom is a multinational company headquartered just outside of Paris, France. In its latest full year report, Alstom reported total revenues of $18 billion. Worldwide, I would say 50% of the company revenue is generated by trains, rolling stock as we call it. The rest of the activity, as I mentioned, signaling activity, service activity, where we do everything from spare parts to full overhaul of trains, including maintenance and operation, all of that represents the other 50%. In the Americas, it's a little bit less of trains, a little bit more of services because we're a big operator, but we spread our revenue across these different product lines. Alstom has been operating in Hornell since the late 90s and has faced some tough times. This facility was almost shut down, it was down to 30 people in 2011, and we restarted the activity by overhauling some equipment and some fleets coming from Boston, from MBTA, or from uh, Maryland. Now I would say the demand is much higher on the uh, new trains, although there is uh, demand as well on overhaul, which is something that we are repositioning in our network. Overall, the company says it's delivered more than 12,000 new or renovated vehicles for U.S. customers and does more than 50 percent of signaling for North American railroads. Alstom, which acquired rail manufacturer Bombardier Transportation in 2021, builds everything from high-speed to commuter trains, light rail vehicles, metros, and the automated trains that take passengers between airport terminals. So the manufacturing process for trains really depends on the specific type of train that you're building. The way to think about it is everything's custom. So it starts with design engineering of the train sets, then moves into a prototype phase, then moves into prototype testing, then into serial production. 
Typically, it'll take anywhere from 36 to 42 months to get to first prototype cars. And then once you have prototype cars into serial production, depending on the quantity of cars, you'll have a program that'll run anywhere from four to six years. Some of the company's projects include building subway cars for the New York City Metro and San Francisco's Bay Area Rapid Transit System, as well as commuter cars for Chicago's Metro Transit Agency. Most recently, Alstom landed a $718 million contract to supply 130 streetcars for the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. The cars will be built in the Hornell facility. Amtrak is another big customer. In 2016, Amtrak chose Alstom to build 28 train sets to replace its aging Acela fleet in the Northeast Corridor. The contract is worth $2 billion. Alstom says it has so far delivered eight of those train sets, which are scheduled to begin service in 2024. In the past six years, we've invested about 60 million in this site in Plant One. A large part of that was to be able to support the Amtrak program and have the capabilities to build high-speed trains in the U.S. We also got really strong support from New York State and Empire State Development, who helped provide grants to be able to drive that activity. 95% of the components and workmanship is done here in the U.S. We developed a tremendous supply base. Today, you probably have about a half dozen different rolling stock suppliers in the U.S. that are building trains. The challenge has always been the fragility of the supply chain behind them. And what we've seen with the investment that Amtrak has made in these next generation high-speed trains is we've brought about a dozen different suppliers from primarily Europe that have set up and done foreign direct investment in the U.S. and have set up factories and have set up capability. Austin is also close to opening a new $50 million manufacturing facility at its site in Hornell. The new facility will be used for making the stainless steel shells for its train cars, which the company has been making in Brazil. As the U.S. government and U.S. DOT has increased Buy America requirements, in order for us to be able to meet the thresholds, we had to be able to uh, you know, increase the content we were building in the U.S. For all the progress that's being made in the development of passenger rail in the U.S., a lot of challenges remain. For one, even though the government's $66 billion may sound like a lot of money, experts say it's a drop in the bucket. The $66 billion that the federal government has put forth for passenger rail is a huge boost, but it's probably half to get to where we need to be to be on par with the rest of the world. In 2021, a federally appointed commission estimated that it would cost $117 billion to make the necessary improvements to the Northeast Corridor alone. Fantuono points out that even the $66 billion is not guaranteed, as a new administration could curtail funding. The biggest challenges facing passenger rail are unfortunately political, they're, they're institutional, uh, systemic, it's this mindset that passenger rail is not worth investing in. Uh, there's a misperception that passenger rail needs to, quote, be profitable. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. It doesn't have to be profitable. It's transportation. It's public service. Passenger trains in the U.S. run along the same tracks as commuter and freight trains. And unlike in China and countries in Europe, where the majority of train infrastructure is nationalized, most of the U.S. rail infrastructure is owned by private freight companies which means that freight trains are usually given priority over passenger trains, despite a legal mandate to prioritize passenger travel. Amtrak estimates that freight trains cause Amtrak passengers 1.1 million minutes, or about two years, of delays in 2022. This is something that passengers may not be willing to put up with. A recent study shows that for North American travelers, price, convenience, and reliability top the list of factors they consider when choosing what transportation to take the level of service reliability and efficiency, the level of frequency and therefore journey time, um, and some level of disruption that customers see has been holding many um, customers back from, from shifting to public transportation. America's aging track system is also not well suited to support the newest train technology. Although the new trains that Alstom is building for Amtrak's Acela service are capable of reaching speeds of 186 miles per hour, the trains will likely top out at 160 miles per hour on small sections of the Northeast Corridor because the infrastructure is so old. This is just 10 miles faster than the current Acela fleet's top speed. If there was infrastructure today in the U.S. that would allow it, these trains behind you can go 186 miles per hour. If we change two things on the train, it can go 220 miles per hour. We don't have high-speed infrastructure to really show what they can do. 
The ideal tracks for high-speed rail have long segments that run in a straight line, have no grade crossings, and are completely isolated from slower freight and commuter rail, aspects currently missing from the U.S. rail infrastructure. But rail manufacturers are adapting. One thing that the U.S. can really leverage with this train and, and a lot of other countries have done is tilting capability. You can save and not have to invest in brand new tracks and brand new infrastructure. You can leverage the existing infrastructure, which is what Amtrak has done. This train is going to have a geo-fenced active tilting system, so it's anticipating a turn that's coming ahead of it. So as it's approaching it, the cars at the front of the train will start tilting in anticipation of the curve and then the train will progressively, in an intentional way, curve at the precise level all the way through the curve to be able to maintain maximum speed and maximum passenger comfort, which is a significant difference compared to what exists in the current Acellas. Aside from legacy customers, Alstom and Siemens hope that demand for passenger rail vehicles will continue to grow with the development of high-speed rail. Several high-speed projects are at different stages of development in the country. On the West Coast, California High-Speed Rail aims to connect Los Angeles to California's Central Valley and San Francisco in Phase 1, while Phase 2 will connect Sacramento to San Diego. The project would encompass over 800 miles of rail. Private company Brightline West plans to build 218 miles of track from Las Vegas to Southern California. And the Cascadia High Speed Rail project aims to connect Eugene, Oregon to Vancouver, Canada. Brightline West has said that Alstom and Siemens are both top contenders to build the company's high speed trains for its West Coast project. But progress on high speed train projects is slow. So far, the California High Speed Rail project is the only one under construction. High speed rail projects in the US often face ballooning costs and endless delays over things like property rights disputes and environmental reviews. Still, some experts believe that all the U.S. needs is just one successful high-speed train project to pave the way. If California gets built, then others will say, oh, you know, we want a high-speed rail system. Anywhere that a system has been built, it's created jobs, it's created economic growth. There's far less pollution caused by passenger rail than by automobiles, and it's a lot safer. Once the, the new generation of trains come, people will realize that it's actually faster, it's more convenient to hop on a train than to actually drive, somehow face the traffic. We've seen exactly the same in Europe. Most of the short distance planes have been replaced by trains. Whether Americans will embrace train travel as eagerly as their European neighbors is yet to be seen, but train manufacturers are optimistic. If you look at our future uh, growth rates on the market, it's only like 4 or 5% compound annual growth rate. But if you go back and look at the market from 2020 to, say, 2030, it's almost a 10% compound annual growth rate. So these, these recent last couple of years have just been great for the industry, both for us and for our competitors.